welcome to what is the first of hopefully many uh, GREX podcast series. This is an initiative by the uh, GREX Young Group to talk with some of the leading people and researchers in exercise for people living with uh, chronic kidney disease. My name is Brett Tarker from the University of South Australia. Today I'm joined by a man who needs little introduction, one of the trailblazers in the exercise and renal space. He is an associate professor in the School of Nursing and Midwifery here at the University of South Australia and research director at Satellite Healthcare in California, USA. Paul Bennett, welcome and thank you for being a part of this podcast. Oh, thank you very much, Brett. It's an honour. So straight into it. So Paul, um, I've known you for a few years now, um, but even I don't, I don't know the origins of this story. Um, so for those that even who don't know you and the ones that do, share your journey. So how does a nurse become such a strong advocate uh, for exercise in the renal space? Once um, I was a nurse manager and a centre manager and a dialysis nurse for about uh, 15 years, um, and we used to see people who would come in and physically deteriorate over five to 10 years and often they couldn't get transplants, often they'd die. Um, and really that was sort of, that stuck with me. Um, I'm not a mental health nurse, so I, I really wasn't that confident with helping from a mental health perspective, but um, from a physical perspective, um, I was, I also, um, you know, had a background in athletics. I was a hundred meter sprinter and, um, I wanted to sort of encourage people to maybe do what I've done, even though there's not going to be too many dialysis patients who are um, going to be running 100 metres on the tartan track. Awesome, awesome. So, so with that in mind, then, tell us about particularly satellite. So satellite is somewhere where they've managed to um, have a real exercise theme uh, within that organisation. So how did exercise become embedded in such a, a, a research, and not, not just a research environment, but from a, a, from a clinical treating point of view? Yeah, um, it's interesting um, that dialysis runs about uh, just over 100 clinics in uh, the US, and these clinics you know, are quite large, most of them. Um, a quarter of them are home dialysis training clinics. So um, when you say they're embedded, they're embedded in some clinics, but in many they're not. And it's often because they're run by the same company, it doesn't mean that they're, they're exactly the same sort of culture. Uh, so certainly there are clinics where they have bikes and they have um, very active professionals who are interested. But the challenges are in America is that it's fundamentally based um, on activity. It's a, it's a, um, a multiple payers and therefore um, the money is tight like anything else. And so exercise professionals, it's, it's difficult to get them into dialysis clinics because your dietitians and social workers are mandated, but not exercise professionals. However, over, not just in satellite, but in the US, there's been a tremendous change over the last five to 10 years, particularly the last three years to increase independence, to increase self-management and to increase home dialysis. And of course, within that, people need to be physically functional. So the physical space, the physical activity space has become a little bit, uh, a little bit more in people's faces, I think. Awesome. So just a little bit of a um, veering away from that now, I'm going to talk more about some of the research that you've completed. So you have done a lot of research in the exercise and renal space. So for people like myself who are only quite new to it, take us back to the early beginnings. What did exercise in the renal space research look like when you first began? You know, um, uh, up to about three or four years ago, I would say there's not a lot of development. You know, what generally we are all about is we're all people with some teams around us who we try and um, improve what we know, our knowledge about uh, physical activity, physical function and kidney disease. Uh, and so we're always continually improving that. What hasn't improved, I don't think, or what hasn't developed is our international collaborations, um, except for the last three or four years with, with um, a global renal exercise uh, group or GREX. Uh, apart from that, um, you know, we have, uh, we have what we think as a change of culture, uh, and then maybe it doesn't, uh, it doesn't happen again. So really, uh, as researchers, um, researchers can tend, tend to chase the money wherever that money is. And we've got to put a priority, I think, on um, money for, for physical function and physical activity for, for people with kidney disease. 
So not a lot is 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 the answer really. Well, then you know, well, my next question is kind of uh, in terms of what do you think has evolved in terms of from perhaps uh, anywhere from 5, 10, 15 years ago to now, has there been any kind of evolvement of the research that's been completed? Yeah, sure. I think I think what we've seen, um, and it's been great, is and G-Rex has been a part of it, has been the inclusion of sort of a global perspective. So we've had more international studies together. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that they weren't international studies, but international studies focusing on exercise and physical activity because really, like I said, people who are, have kidney disease, who are on dialysis, who have had transplants, who have CKD, uh, they have similar problems all around the world, no matter where you are. Um, and so that, that's important that we can learn from each other with this global perspective. And I think the other change is the increasingly um, engagement with people with kidney disease. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, generally we've been researchers and we haven't engaged traditionally with people who are the experts of what it's like living with kidney disease, those with lived experience. And, and over the last five years, we've seen a real, a real increase in the, the engagement with people with kidney disease, helping to shape our research. That leads nicely into my, my next question, actually. So you've mentioned international collaboration and more consumer engagement. So are there any other notable gaps in the renal exercise research that you think will, will additionally help shape research over the next five years? Um, I think the inclusion of, uh, of people with kidney disease will help move this forward. Um, and because I see the major gap is the application of our research to clinical practice. So that engagement, the, um, the knowledge translation, I think that piece is, is really vital because we don't see all of the things we know about, um, about the uh, lack of activity, the lack of physical function, the barriers, the sedentary behaviour of a lot of the people with kidney disease. We don't know how to, how to change that and, and put that into practice, even though we sort of know where we want to get to uh, it's getting there which is the which is the complex part and needs more um, basically clinical applicability research yeah awesome yep so take talking about yourself now your own research now what are a couple of your own uh, research highlights that you've had over your career i think what 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 um i could consider highlights are teams that I've been involved with, I think, and, and been a part of that motivational team. So, so some of those teams have been the, the G-REX team, and I think that's been one of the highlights, has been the culmination of this. Our perineal dialysis exercise um, recommendations team, they're the sorts of things that I see as, as team highlights because you can do so much more together. Um, and I've just been a little bit of a, a little bit of a cog in the wheel. But I then get back to some of the highlights um, that uh, I've received personally, which have been people on dialysis telling me that they feel so much better when they've been doing it. So they're the highlights to me. And now I learn from people who um, are, the, are the experts and, and, and can tell me how to do my research and tell me what they need out of something that, that we're doing. So I, I think they're the highlights, particularly going back and, and hearing from people um, who have benefited from some of the research that not just that I do, but the whole of, you know, the whole of the sort of profession does. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So last question in this sort of, sort of research um, space is what advice would you give for a, a young researcher who's perhaps a little bit overwhelmed in the presence of such highly experienced researchers such as yourself? I'm trying to refrain, but I'm just going to say about imposter syndrome, which we can't seem to get away from. What kind of words would you pass on to a young researcher like that? Yeah, so um, interestingly enough, uh, I still have it, the imposter syndrome. So, uh, and many of us do, and I think that's a healthy thing because we, we are all on a journey and we're all at different stages of that journey. And I think um, I can learn and as much from um, people who you've talked about who might think that they're younger in this, but certainly we get ideas from everywhere. You get ideas from me, I get ideas from you. Uh, so it's a, it's a journey, uh, you know, and, and the journey, so I don't feel I'm in a place to give advice to someone else who's on a different journey. In saying that, what um, one of the, one of the uh, things that's helped me is to find a niche that you're passionate about and work to that niche 
and just enjoy what you're doing at the time. We're always thinking there's another thing. There's a there's a Cat One research grant that's going to happen, and we'll be happy when we get one of those. There's a, a two million dollar grant that we want. We'll be happy when we um, we finish our PhD. We'll be happy when we finish our PhD. Well, actually, it's just all part of a big long journey. And so, uh, so enjoy what you're doing right now because we're always learning from what we're doing. And if you're not enjoying it, find something else to do.